Hello, my name is Anna Corvan and I'm a mum of two children. My son Simon is 13 and my daughter Chloe is 8. Um, and Simon was born with a severe intellectual disability. So we live down in the south of France. Uh, I moved here when I was 22 um, and my husband is French so we speak a mixture of English and French at home. So I'm making this video in order to share with you a little bit about my experience of um, having a child with a disability in France. Um, talking about some of the challenges that that's thrown up, um, but also the opportunities that we've managed to find through it and, and some of the amazing organisations and people that we've um, been lucky to meet and find out about. Um, and I'd like to talk about this in four parts. Um, and really, for me, they're the four aspects, I think, that have made this journey more interesting for me um, and, and helped me to deal with um, Simon's disability a lot more. So the first point is um, the idea of seeing potential in everybody. Um, when Simon was very young, um, and I'm sure this is true for many parents with a child who has developmental delay, um, so much of our time was taken up with hospital visits and doctor's appointments and tests. Um, and so much of that was focused on the negatives. So it was often talking about um, the things that Simon wasn't capable of doing, the milestones that he hadn't yet reached, and in some cases even talking about the things that he might never be able to do. And I think it's so easy as a parent to get bogged down in all that negative information and, and sometimes to lose sight of how wonderful your child is and, and how much he is actually doing. Um, and I'm not suggesting that this is, is a French experience in any way. I think it's probably true um, for many parents around the world. Um, but one thing that I did find here is that as a general rule, um, the medical model of dealing with disability is still um, very much used here in France. And so a disabled person is seen as somebody who needs to be fixed or cured. Um, and I've noticed that in a number of areas such as the fact that even though we've never had a formal diagnosis for Simon, um, people often talk about the fact that he must have a genetic illness. Um, so it's the language that we use to describe that disability that, that kind of focuses on the medical side. Um, and also the fact that Simon, because of uh, his disability, uh, he can't go to school here in France, but he goes to what's called an institution. And these institutions are funded by the regional department or the regional authorities for health. Um, so very much separate from what other children uh, have, which obviously is access to schools and to a national curriculum. Um, and so having this idea given to you that your child is in some way broken and needs to be fixed, it's incredibly heavy for, for parents to deal with. But then in 2015, um, I first heard about the approach Intensive Interaction uh, through a friend of mine. Um, and then I went to look at it a lot further and read about it and um, watched the DVD and, and got in touch with the Institute as well in the UK. Um, and I was just bowled over by how all those negatives suddenly disappeared. And people were saying to me, but your son is communicating in so many ways already. Um, he's got such potential as a communicator. And if you can just give him that time uh, uh, to practice the fundamentals of communication, he's going to continue to grow as a communicator. Um, and I remember a really, a really wonderful moment right at the beginning when I started having a go at intensive interaction and Simon was just tapping a rhythm on the, the window in the living room and I went over to him and just tried to sort of join in with what he was doing and it was magical because I realised all of the different sounds he was experimenting with, all of the sensory feedback that he was getting from that. And also the fact that I could just join in with that and, and give him those wonderful social communication 
moments and opportunities that were going to help him to learn and to grow. Um, and I think that through intensive interaction, I've learned two really valuable lessons. One is that happiness is infectious. So whereas before I perhaps went around feeling afraid of the way people would look at us and judge us, um, Simon's taught me to just go out there and enjoy being with him and enjoy all the sensory things that he loves. So stamping about in the leaves in the park or singing very loudly around the supermarket, that's another of his favourites. Um, and I've noticed that in doing that, people actually sort of join in in a way or they smile or they take an interest in him and they ask questions where perhaps before they wouldn't have dared ask them. Um, and then the other lesson I've learnt is that language is just such a tiny part of communication. Um, and the, the way that humans communicate is so much more rich and varied. Um, we started off as a bilingual family, um, and we are again today, but for a, a short time I was told to stop speaking English to Simon. And it was the hardest thing that I think I've ever been asked to do, or one of the hardest things. Um, and. I now realise that actually in doing that, I was cutting him off from so much of communication that isn't language, all the emotional input that we have, everything that's intonation and the melody of a language. Um, and when I finally found the courage to bring English back uh, into our communication, he grew so much more again as a communicator um, and even started saying a few words in English. So. He says mummy occasionally now, and he also says oh dear um, if he hurts himself. So I realise that must be something I must say quite a lot. So because of all these really positive experiences that we were able to have through intensive interaction, um, and because I really wanted to share this with other families and, and also professionals in France, um, I started talking to, to various different people about it. And together we decided to set up a non-profit organisation out here in France, which is called Intensive Interaction France, um, and which allows people to find out about the approach and to get training, um, to learn about how to practice it. Um, and also the idea is to create a community um, around this approach so that more and more people can find out about how to how to help people with PMLD, with different disabilities, with intellectual disabilities, um, to grow as, as communicators and to enjoy social communication. Um, the second point I wanted to talk about is the idea of community and a network of people who are interested in disability and interested in improving the lives of people living with disability. Um, so, I was quite struck by the fact when Simon was little that it was really difficult for me to meet other families uh, who had children with um, some kind of developmental delay. And so I often felt quite, quite lonely, quite isolated um, in trying to deal with Simon's disability and found it really hard to find information also about uh, which specialists to go and see and how best to help Simon. Um, I think also having had my daughter and having um, really appreciated the, the, the friendships that I've been able to make with other parents and that possibility to just talk about um, your experience as a parent, I realised I really needed that with Simon as well and perhaps even more so because it, sometimes it, was, it seemed so much more difficult. Um, also with the fact that Simon goes to a special needs institution and goes there every day by taxi, it means that I don't have that opportunity to meet other parents at the school gate and, and to chat with them and to get to know them. Um, but I'm really pleased to say that that situation does seem to be changing at the minute and that more and more organisations are, are popping up all over France um, to allow parents to connect and to share experiences and to learn from one another. Um, and not just parents actually, but professionals are often um, involved as well and, and giving some really valuable ideas um, and in fact also here in Arles, um, I've been able to help set up a, a parent cafe which takes place once a month and it's just such a good opportunity to both to look at what's difficult in our daily lives but also to think about how as a team, as a, as a collective, 
we can think about solutions and we can come up with ideas um, that can help us to move forward and, and, and find uh, good ideas and good contacts as well. Um, I also want to mention uh, an organisation close to Paris where one of the founding members uh, decided to set up a YouTube channel um, during the pandemic last year or at the start of the pandemic and on a very regular basis she interviews parents and professionals and anyone who is involved in the world of disability um, and through that you can just learn such a huge amount of information and um, hear some wonderful accounts of, of the really inspiring work that different people are doing. Um, the third thing I want to talk about is the idea of raising awareness. Um, as I've mentioned already, uh, I really felt isolated in the beginning um, and, and I'm sure that it's the experience of a lot of other families as well. And I think that there are perhaps two barriers uh, at the moment um, that we're up against here in France and maybe it's true of other countries as well. Um, one of them is that accessibility is still very limited. And I mean that in terms of physical accessibility, but also cognitive accessibility. Um, there is a law here in France that's been in place since 2005, which rules that all public places have to be accessible. Um, but it still seems just too easy to get around that law and to avoid um, creating accessible spaces. So that's one point. And I think the other point is as I've mentioned, this sort of fear of disability or the way that disability is still viewed here. Um, and in a way, it's, it's kind of a vicious cycle because um, the more that people feel that they are stared at if they have uh, a family member with a disability, the more that they don't feel the desire to go out so much or they want to keep away from society. And in keeping away from society, of course, it means that members of the general public don't get that opportunity to meet people who are living with disability. So one of the things that I've learnt is, is really vital is to find the courage to answer questions and encourage, particularly children, encourage children to ask questions about disability and to find out about it. Um, I know that in the very beginning I'd, I'd sometimes struggle, I'd feel that people were making fun of us, um, but actually I've learned that that's not it at all. It's more from a lack of understanding and that actually people, um, by asking questions, they're, they're just trying to find out a bit more. So um, I think it's so important that we try to answer those questions and that we try to talk about it uh, in the best way that we can. So one of the things that I'm feeling quite excited about at the moment in France is the increase in the number of supported and inclusive living projects that are springing up. Um, I think there is a drive at the moment um, to fund uh, these inclusive uh, supported living spaces, um, partly because so many families are now saying we don't want our child um, to live in an institution outside of society. We want him or her to have a full life, a social life, be able to be part of the local community, take part in activities. Um, and so um, people and, and also professionals are getting together to, uh, to imagine these inclusive living spaces um, and to see how best to include them in the local communities. So I'm really hoping that we're going to see projects like this happening in our local area. And then the fourth and final point that I want to make is about the, the need and also the possibilities to reach out to other places, other people in different countries to, to get more information about what's happening elsewhere to help people um, with disability. Um, I know that it particularly during the lockdowns, um, during this pandemic, I found that there's a whole wealth of information out there on the internet, YouTube channels, webinars, um, a podcast. There's a podcast in Canada that I've really enjoyed listening to called The Good Things in Life. Um, and it just gives you a completely different vision of uh, how to live with disability. And here, of course, I really want to mention the PMLD conference 
and say a huge thank you to Joanna for having this idea, for setting it up, for doing all the work that it must involve to get all of that put together um, and, and, and sent out in the Facebook group. Um, when I listened to the first PMLD conference, I was just bowled over by how many amazing stories there were and how much information I could get and, and discover, um, particularly about all around teaching and schools and so on. Um, so thank you so much as well to all the people that contributed those videos um, because it's just been so wonderful to, to listen to all those accounts. So as a further thank you, um, it's obviously it's not very easy uh, for, for all of us to travel at the moment. So I thought I'd bring a, just a little bit of Provence to you um, and share with you a sensory walk that Simon and I went on a short while ago in a place near to us, which is called Les Alpilles. It's um, a small group of hills just near here. Um, and it's a place that we love to go because of all the different sensory experiences that Simon can enjoy and all of the different ways in which that allows us to, to laugh together and just enjoy being together and chat together. So enjoy this little walk in the Alpine. dans les roseaux. Simon s'est arrêté pour l'écouter. Heureusement qu'il y avait beaucoup de cailloux. On cherche, on cherche des cailloux pour Simon. Ah, ça fait crac. On aime bien jouer avec la poussette aussi. Regarde, elle est là la poussette. Elle est là la poussette. Ah. On va la pousser Et on a parlé ensemble. Qu'est-ce que c'est joli ici On s'est arrêté pour jouer avec les cailloux encore Qu'est-ce à trouver ici? Oh, oh, oh. oh 
sur la veste de maman. Merci Simon. Maman, oui, maman. Ah, tu veux qu'on continue Allez, on continue. Qu'est-ce que tu fais <rire>